Hi, I'm Kathy Flynn, and we're glad to have you here with us on our first fireside chat, Zooming this year, so that we can share more about the wonderful things and all the treasures and the wonderful people who created so many things for us here in New Mexico. Back in the 30s, with the New Deal programs that were put together by Franklin Roosevelt, our then president, and all of his people. Today, we are particularly happy to have the opportunity to honor women, since it marches the month for women. And we're going to hear from a very fine woman who's going to tell us all about another fine woman. So let me introduce Bettina Raphael, an art conservator who has her uh, degrees in art history and art objects conservator work. So she's a, she does objects instead of uh, paintings and that sort of thing, because uh, there are a lot of those things out there. And uh, we're very pleased to have her here. She's been here in Santa Fe for a number of years and is pretty well known in this beyond this community, but definitely in this area uh, because of all of the things that she has done from the 18th century art restore people to Olive Rush, the one that she's really known for here in the art conservation circles. Who was Olive Rush? She was one of our fine female artist during the New Deal here in Santa Fe. And you're going to learn about her today at this, during this Zoom fireside chat sponsored by the New Mexico chapter of the National New Deal Preservation Association. And uh, we would let you know that uh, if you would like to share this with someone else or you want to look at it again later, it will be on our website, which is nndpanewmexico.org. And we hope that you will enjoy what we have today, thanks to Bettina Raphael. Please join us. Well, thank you, Kathy, for uh, such a fine introduction, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, one of my favorite characters and someone who I've been researching and learning about for the last almost 15 years, Olive Rush, um, a painter, a Quaker, uh, an independent woman early in the this century who um, really left her mark on Santa Fe though she didn't come here until age 47, she was one of the first uh, women to uh, be welcomed into the um, art colony here in Santa Fe and left her mark on many people and many places. Um, and especially um, in the 1930s when there were these public art programs, uh, Olive was asked to do six different uh, major murals and um, and so we're going to honor her today. And uh, I'm afraid that un unlike um, FDR, this fireside chat is maybe more like a gallop. Um, <laughs> I, I have a lot of material to share and uh, we'll go through it fairly fast, I hope. But um, I, th I think it should be uh, enjoyable, I hope. But first I'm going to go over a bit of her, her personal history um, so that we have a, uh, and all, all of you have a little bit of idea of her, her, would you go back please? Yeah. Of her artistic work before she became a muralist, which wasn't until the 1930s. So all of, uh, Rebecca Rush was born in Indiana in a rural community fair, near Fairmont. Um, and this is a picture of the family home. The family was a, a, a stalwart Quaker 
family that had um, moved to Indiana in a previous generation uh, from the East Coast. Her father, who you see in the other um, slide, uh, was a minister uh, in the Quaker uh, meeting. And the, the family was um, very, very much drawn into the values and the uh, history of, of Quaker uh, social activity and social justice. Um, and quite uh, ironically, however, um, one of the, the Quaker tenants of, the, of this period was um, a kind of uh, resistance to many forms of art. Uh, there was almost a prohibition on painting, um, even some musical um, activities, um, fic fictional writing, but especially the visual arts were kind of targeted as something that was considered uh, it, not that relevant to a spiritual life. Um, but Olive proved stood up to um, those prohibitions and with the support of her parents, she um, had definitely uh, uh, artistic skills from a very early age. Um, and eventually um, at the tender age of 16, she, she went off to uh, Earl of College in nearby uh, uh, Richmond, Indiana. Uh, to study art. But here she is on the left, uh, probably around 1890s, an 18, 20 year old um, who uh, is very close to her family. It's her sisters on the right and Olive in the chair. Um, her sisters and her cousins. It was a very close knit family, all, all with a, um, again, a, a strong Quaker background. And, um, but it was a time in Quakerism when uh, there wasn't quite this, the um, starkness and the um, uh, extreme uh, plainness that had occurred in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, you can see that everyone is dressed kind of in a uh, Victorian white and um, they were quite worldly uh, and uh, all of uh, kind of bucked any sort of restraints in the rest of her life when she went on to uh, study art and travel the world. Now here's an example. Um, uh, after, after going to uh, Earlham, and, and she was only there for a year, and her parents, who were also artistic, um, really supported her in that desire to continue studies in, in the arts. And from Earlham, she went on uh, very soon to um, Washington, D.C., where her sister was living. And she had an opportunity to study at the Corcoran uh, Gallery and in Washington. Uh, it was a very serious academic program for artists, um, that, starting with um, kind of classical training. Um, there were surprisingly uh, a number of women in the early classes, which was a novelty for the, uh, this was already not the 1890s. Um, but previous to that, um, women had been largely excluded from many of the art programs. Um, that was just the first program that she attended. Um, she went on to uh, study further in the uh, Academy in Philadelphia, Academy of Art and and the um, Art Students League in New York, which was really uh, probably the most formative experience she had uh, in, in an instructional way. Uh, the, the, the group on the right um, is are her colleagues from Boston and uh, they are uh, the people she studied with a bit later in the, about the 19 teens. But here you see her, at, I think at Rush Hill, her family home, um, painting in the garden. And we have a number of paintings from that period, many of which are of the family, um, portraits that she painted of members of the family and, um, and of scenes around uh, her home territory of Rush Hill. But she, by um, age 18, 19, she was launched into the world. Uh, this this uh, uh, 
rural, um, tim timid in, in certain ways, a uh, young woman, um, branched out and um, spent a number of years in New York City, became a, a successful illustrator there, um, and actually had, had commissions and regular uh, work for a magazine such as Ladies Home Companion, um, Scribner's, and she was also um, designing illustrations for uh, various books and authors of the time. She did a little bit of writing herself of articles for, for contemporary magazines. Um, and, um, and the lower picture, you can see that uh, she's accompanied by other women artists. She had a very close relationship with a number of, of women um, artists, especially in Delaware, where she was uh, working um, and studying with uh, Howard Pyle, who was a very well-known illustrator. Um, and in 1911, she actually went on to Paris in the photograph on the right, where she is um, on the streets of Paris and has, uh, has spent a number of months studying and painting uh, with well-known instructors uh, in both England and France. So she is launched. And here's an, a number of examples of her early work, uh, just so that you have a feeling for some of the um, more academic styles, the beginning of her, um, her talent and her expression. The, um, the figure on the upper right um, was, was drawn uh, way back in, um, in Richmond at Earlham. The uh, woman sitting on a rock, a girl on a rock, it's known as, um, is supposedly in the uh, Hudson River uh, at the Palisades behind the young woman. And there are different stories about this painting. It was, It is in oil. It was done with a palette knife, which I think was a, a novelty for Olive to try. Um, but she... Uh, there's, there are people who uh, believe this to be um, Georgia O'Keeffe uh, as her model because Georgia and uh, Olive were uh, compatriots at the Art Students League and they actually shared with a number of other women uh, a, a studio in New York. So before coming to New Mexico, the two um, women in the arts knew each other and um, Though very different in character, I think they respected each other and each other's work. The other uh, pictures you he see here are, are largely uh, from illustrations from uh, book, uh, from publications or um, magazine uh, monthlies, weekly journals. Um, but I will point out that the um, very um, strong painting in, in the center, lower center, this, this was done in 1914, um, and it is, uh, it, it, I think you will see the difference, that it is a, a more um, personal, more um, stronger, I think, painting, and perhaps with more influence of um, some of the Impressionists, um, but and, and has a great deal of pathos. This painting was done uh, in on her way uh, to Santa Fe. And that uh, was an event that changed Olive's life significantly. Her father, the minister, was fond of going west. And um, he took a trip to Arizona and New Mexico with his daughter, two daughters, uh, in 1914. And Olive took her paints along and did this painting um, while she was in the Southwest in, in New Mexico, she did a number of paintings and was um, actually invited to have a one woman show at the Palace of the Governors, which was the Museum of New Mexico in that era. This is 1914 before we had a fine arts museum here in Santa Fe. And um, a, a one woman show because of the strength, based on the strength of these works. So, um, having had a taste of the Southwest and liking it in 1914, Olive uh, kind of made her focus 
returning to the Southwest and especially Santa Fe. She realized it was an art colony even then, that it was a landscape and um, a uh, quality of light that she loved. And um, so she planned for the next four years to return. And so by 1920, she made uh, her, her own dream come true, thanks to um, some inheritance of a, a, a bit of money and from doing portraits for a, a couple of years in um, Indianapolis and saving uh, money for from these very well received portraits. So she arrives uh, alone in Santa Fe. This is what Canyon Road looked like on the left uh, around 1915 to 18. Um, it was a simple uh, dirt road traversed by burrows and goats and and uh, people walking to their farmhouses. There were many fields up along the road. Um, families uh, lived off of these, uh, the crops of these fields and Olive was um, enthralled with this whole experience and she bought uh, very quickly an adobe farm house that you can see on the upper right, um, still in its adobe uh, condition uh, in the 1960s that that facade and all the walls were plastered with with uh, a cement plaster as was the the um, style in the 60s. But um, it was a, a simple house. She um, she made some significant renovations, altered uh, parts, expanded a little bit, um, and also planted um, a, a major garden around the house, especially in the large backyard and later uh, another property she bought next door so that she had um, uh, apple trees and apricot trees and um, all sorts of uh, lilacs that bloomed um, on cue. She was known for um, spring and people coming to her garden for tea parties just to see the f uh, array of flowers. And there's some, some have said that she actually planted these flowers uh, uh, in, in an array similar to her palette of paints on, on her palette. I don't know if that's true, but um, she, she loved that garden and she was very proud of it. Now this later um, photographs from 47, um, you can see that it's, uh, even in 1947, it was um, aging and this house and studio still exists. And um, it is, uh, it was left by Olive to uh, the Santa Fe uh, Religious Society of Friends uh, and the Quaker uh, community, which was very small at this time, uh, 10, perhaps 15 people at the most, but she wanted the Quaker uh, community to have a place to meet regularly and her home on Canyon Road, very central, very um, historic also because it's an 1840s, 50s uh, structure. She, um, she dedicated to the Quaker community. Now, um, I, I attended Quaker meeting for many years and uh, that's where I came to know Olive and know of her collection that is housed in um, the studio here on Canyon Road and that she, um, much of her memorabilia and much of herself really remains in that house. So that was really the, the, the start of my interest in her um, legacy. Here's some more uh, pictures of the garden that I think you'll, you can appreciate the one on the left being very contemporary with huge lilacs. Um, at the far end is a, a fresco on the wall that we'll see in a minute. There's a guest house on the lower right that <clears throat> this is somewhere um, she believed in uh, the Quaker ministry of hospitality. 
that is actually a named ministry for Quakers. And she invited uh, young people, especially who were crossing the nation, going from East Coast to West Coast, to come and stay with her here in the guest house. It had previously been a, a goat uh, corral, and she had it um, upgraded, and it's still uh, in existence and is still used for um, a resident uh, on the property. Um, and uh, Quakers and, and others um, still visit the house and um, have opportunities to stay in a guest apartment that is in the main part of the house. The upper picture on the right is not olive, but it does show you uh, something of the garden. Again, apricot tree, front and foremost. Um, the, uh, the orno, where you can bake bread, the traditional Spanish and Indian orno. And uh, behind that, there was kind of a root cellar where canned vegetables and um, other other delicacies were stored. So we're now inside Olive's home. And uh, this is where her uh, experience and love of painting on adobe walls really began. She noted when she bought the, her home that um, they were wonderful, smooth, uh, voluptuous walls that uh, just begged to be painted. And so here she had this um, corner fireplace built. She designed it, had it built, and she proceeded to uh, paint it with frescoes. Now, fresco painting is an old, old world technique, very well known in Italy. Um, she, she never had real instruction in it, but she read Cennino Cennini, the Italian spe um, uh, Renaissance uh, knowledgeable person on, on it. Um, she had seen uh, frescoes um, in her two trips to Europe. She knew about uh, Greek paintings on walls and the Roman uh, frescoes are, are still surviving today. And she was aware too of the Mexicans that in Mexico, um, Diego Rivera and Orozco and others were turning to uh, fresco and mural uh, paintings as a form of public art and communication. It was often uh, considered a social media in that um, many of those early uh, murals by, by someone like uh, Diego Rivera had political themes and uh, commentaries. So Olive uh, starts out in her own home with pretty um, decorative uh, uh, fresco, which is, uh, in fact, uh, the, the technique is, is pretty simple, but not, not easy. Uh, a wet plaster is laid down in sections, and then the artist takes their paints and mixed with water uh, their, their pigments and paints into the wet plaster. So in a sense, the, the paint is sealed into the plaster. And that's why this, um, these paintings exist today. It, um, you can see that they have suffered. This is the contemporary picture on the right uh, from the fireplace. Um, it has discolored some of the um, images. Uh, other areas seem to have faded somewhat and um, this, this, is, however, is her, her initial experiment in uh, fresco painting and um, one that is certainly worth preserving. We, the, the meeting house um, has a number of frescoes, all of which um, need work. This is, again, her studio, and this is a lintel painting uh, strip above the, the doorway, the large entranceway to her studio. Um, you can see some of her, her collection of pottery, Southwest pottery. Um, her, her painting was done in this room that we cannot see, the, uh, it's behind us, um, because artists of this era didn't take their, their artwork to galleries for the most part. Many of them had um, studios in their homes and they sold from their homes. They, um, and, and this is 
uh, has been up until very recently the meeting room uh, for the, the, the Quaker uh, meeting in Santa Fe. They just recently and moved to a new facility, a larger facility, but this um, hosted uh, Quaker silent meetings for many years. And you can see that it's very decorative. As I said, her use of flowers um, borrowed sometimes. They're not necessarily her inventions. Uh, there's a kind of a Pennsylvania Dutch and also some Mexican um, uh, predecessors to, to these images that she, she copied. Or she had many um, drawings and studies, which are also part of uh, her studio and homes uh, collection of her of her historic uh, work. Here's another um, fresco. This one's in the garden, and uh, she did several paintings in the garden which have not survived well. Um, you can see on the on the left in the forties it was stronger, but um, it, it, as of um, two thousand and seventeen. Um, it had been exposed to weathering and um, the colors themselves have been affected. They've been abraded by wind and other um, factors in, in the environment. We have covered it now with a plexiglass cover, but this too really needs to be stabilized and uh, perhaps some areas restored uh, based on the earlier images that we have of it. This is interesting. It's sort of an Egyptian version of uh, Pueblo women gathering water from a, a pond or a lake. And in the background, you see three deer and we'll see how the deer become almost a iconic uh, image that Olive uses uh, throughout the 1930s in many, many of her paintings. She kind of identified, I think, um, deer and antelope perhaps with gentleness and uh, maybe even uh, Quakerly values. This is another uh, portrait, it's very small, of a young boy in the garden uh, as it looked in the 40s on the left and on the right as it looks today. Uh, we have not um, experimented yet to see how much of it remains intact below this layer of salts and accretions uh, that have come from the plaster that surrounds it but there, where there's hope that we can recover something of this original. Now this is, uh, this, this work that Olive did on her own home was really uh, in the early twenties, really uh, brought her to the attention of others in the community who liked the idea of frescoes in their gardens and paintings on their walls. And um, here's an example um, of a, a larger piece that she did uh, also in the 20s, and uh, it, it gives you a little bit of feeling for how she's can, she's moving towards a more abstract style. It, up until coming to Santa Fe, uh, she had been classically trained and was very literal, and also the illustration background made for a, a real uh, narrative and lit literal uh, figurative style. But she's beginning to branch out here. She had um, seen the, the uh, Armory show in New York. She knew about the modern uh, directions art was taking in Europe and in the US. Um, and uh, this is this particularly exciting um, image. Again, uh, you have the deer appearing. We have not found where this is yet. <laughs> we only have records that it exists. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, now, th this is another uh, private commission. Uh, the uh, drawing at the top is called Blessings of the Asequia. And um, I'm looking for a little quote about it. Um, the, it uh, it's a drawing, and she showed this in uh, various exhibits because Olive arrived, you know, in, in Santa Fe, she was already age 47. She had spent half her life on the East Coast and in various places, showing her artwork, selling her artwork. Uh, she was very well known. Major museums had already begun buying her art. And I think she showed this 
drawing a proposal for the uh, mural at, in the, the Brooklyn Museum in the early, uh, late twenties, perhaps. Um, yes, lots of sequias. Her description of it is a running stream that waters the land, making the lambs and other animals to bound with joy and the desert places to blossom. So she was fond of, of uh, animals that uh, uh, inhabit many of her, her later paintings. Um, she has a, a very um, positive and kind of lyrical image of nature. And uh, below in the same house where this uh, a fresco was commissioned, um, the owners asked her to paint a wooden um, cabinet, a kind of a whole wall of cabinetry in a dressing room. Uh, and she proceeded to use not, of course, not fresco, but um, either tempera paints or, or uh, oil. And, but you're beginning to see some of uh, this openness that, that was also present um, in a few of her earlier works where the, it became characteristic of her almost that there are spaces that, that are functional in her paintings, that negative space plays a very important part. And um, th these still exist and um, can be seen on with uh, an invite. Um, so we're, we're moving on now to uh, larger and more impressive uh, commissions. This is the home, Los Luceros, of Mary Cabot Wheelwright. She was one of the conoscenti from the East Coast, a, a wealthy woman, an independent woman who came West, as did many women at this era, uh, who um, were looking for in many ways, a different um, way of life and a greater freedom, I think. Uh, the West seemed to offer that to Olive as well as all these other women who were um, adventurers. And um, this, this home was built um, outside of Santa Fe. It's about a 45 minute drive from Santa Fe. It still exists. It's now owned by the state. And Mary Cabot Wheelwright hired Olive to paint her fireplaces, which was now a tradition that she had started in her own home. So here's an example of the downstairs fireplace, which has a lovely lilting kind of arabesque feeling to it. Again, she's leaving a lot of open space, um, frolicking uh, goats around the opening of the fireplace and up the chimney, an owl, uh, other, other birds and plants and flowers. Um, really uh, quite, quite delightful and decorative. This is the upstairs in Los Luceros. Um, and it was uh, the kind of more formal um, uh, uh, living room and, and uh, welcoming space with its own fireplace. And uh, you, you can see the proportions of it are, are very different. Again, though, it has this very light background. And uh, up close, you can see, again, a theme with horses. She followed that up later in her life with a number of very important paintings of horses on the mesa. Um, this um, choya flowers down on the lower right uh, the, these are cactus flowers that are very well known around New Mexico. And um, uh, she was she was calling on many of the images uh, that were uh, characteristic of the Southwest. The magpies also on the uh, uh, fireplace on the and uh, and uh, Mary Cabot Wheelwright was a um, significant person. She ran in significant circles. She founded uh, the Wheelwright Museum, uh, was a, a patron of Navajo uh, weavers and um, uh, chant uh, sayers, um, 
and would have invited the very interesting people to this home and who would have enjoyed Olive's work. Again, another um, famous and um, productive woman from the East, uh, Frances Bartlett. And Frances bought a, uh, um, a dude ranch just outside of Española. Again, quite close to where Mary Cabot Wheelwright was living. And the two women uh, both appreciated Olive's work. And this is a very small uh, mural that she painted, I believe in fresco, um, above the fireplace. And you can see in it kind of a different style. This is that um, sort of more, more stylized, uh, simple, but Def definitely characteristic trees and other plants that are distilled into kind of the essence of what they are. And she uses this um, in many later uh, paintings that we'll see. Um, here, there she is, uh, Olive seated in the a portion of that dude ranch, which um, Frances Bartlett had converted into a patio, uh, a, an enclosed patio. And Olive was asked to do, uh, again, uh, murals. Uh, she was not doing these in fresco. I think it was um, uh, either tempera paint again, or, or um, oil on plaster. Uh, and it was with um, a, a Mexican or an Hispanic theme. In general, you can see the, the burrows stacked up with wood. Um, and she used some of the imagery that she developed um, at a, in an earlier phase of her painting for these walls. And we'll, we'll go back in time right now uh, because those were her the private commissions. But um, in the late 20s, uh, Olive began to receive some commercial uh, commissions, that is larger projects. In this case, it was La Fonda Hotel which had existed already for many years and was considered the end of the Santa Fe Trail and was a, a historic building itself and um, was being renovated around 1928 uh, by the architect John Gamim, who had hired Mary Coulter to do the interior designs and uh, renovations. And she was just um, gung-ho for Olive's work. She, uh, she asked for um, some sketches to start with. Olive continued with this theme of, uh, again, plants and nature, but in the, in the larger um, ballroom, which is these doors lead to that, she was, she was given really one of the biggest rooms in the hotel to uh, decorate, to uh, mural, uh, create murals to fill this large space. And here, here's a, a very early photograph of the um, painting. I don't know if it was uh, finished totally, uh, but it, it gives you a sense of the, the scale and also these themes. There are uh, Spanish dancers, there are cowboys, um, uh, charros, Mexican uh, uh, cowboys, and, and also um, some local scenes with um, goats, again, <laughs> pulling laundry off the line um, of, of backyards and, and simple uh, imagery from Santa Fe of that era. And in the lower right, you can see that same mural later in the 40s uh, when it was still there and it was still being um, used. It was, uh, it was sometimes used as a ballroom, sometimes as a large dining room. But unfortunately, all of these murals uh, were destroyed, as were those in uh, Francis Bartlett's home, um, except for that one over that small uh, fresco over the fireplace. All, all the others have been painted over or somehow destroyed as the use of buildings changed or as uh, tastes changed. And in some cases, um, actually buildings were, were some of the ado older adobes at the uh, guest ranch were crumbling. 
Now, this based on that success um, that Olive had at the La Fonda Hotel because it was celebrated at the end of the, uh, uh, her work on it and the opening of the uh, renovated hotel. It was a huge party and Olive was really a center uh, of focus uh, for her work. It was highly acclaimed. But based on that, um, Chester Ferris, who was the recently appointed head of the Santa Fe Indian School, which was a, a boarding school, just like many others in the country, uh, for Native Americans uh, to be taught, but also uh, in many cases changed uh, to, to be uh, acculturated into an, uh, an Anglo-American society. Uh, fortunately, the Santa Fe Indian School uh, resisted some of that influence and uh, really had a much better reputation for respecting um, traditions and uh, Native American integrity and, and, and wishes. But um, Chester Ferris was of that mind. He also was a Quaker in, in his background and he was very impressed with what Olive had done um, uh, in the uh, in the La Fonda Hotel, and he asked her to come and paint the uh, dining room of the school. And she uh, humbly, and there she is right in the center with her arms crossed and her concho belt on, she uh, deferred to the students. And she said, I think the students can do this work if I help them, if I get them going. Um, they, had not, they had been painting, there'd been a number of art uh, initiatives it, at the Santa Fe Indian School and at the Pueblos, uh, but nothing of this scale. This is this is very different to be painting murals on on this size. So uh, all of uh, there's some of the artists with her, as well as a couple of the dignitaries visiting the opening ceremony. Um, the students set to work. And Olive was amazed at their ability to um, project their art onto this scale, and that they had such integrity uh, and sense of their own style, and that was very clear. She didn't have to teach them anything other than maybe some pointers about how to work on on uh, on a scale like this. But um, they were all their own images. And she what became um, really a dedicated supporter of Native American uh, artists. And based on this uh, experiment, really, um, there were not only Pueblo, Navajo, and Kiowa artists, but other artists in the school and out in the other uh, tribal communities uh, drew her attention. And she um, helped them for the next decade, at least, by um, giving talks about the quality of Native American art, uh, about uh, and showing it to uh, many people, and talking of the in, um, the spirituality of that art, um, and she promoted it uh, by uh, arranging for th these artists to do uh, some murals on canvas that were sent to the. Um, the Chicago Fair uh, of Progress. Uh, it was a in the 1932. Um, uh, uh, there was a, a a building built for with a Mayan theme for I guess indigenous people, maybe Mexican theme also. But so their their paintings were shown there, and then subsequently were shown all over the East Coast. They all of helped uh, promote these artists and got them exhibits at the Museum of Modern Art, the Corcoran Gallery, um, Rockefellers became involved, and um, really they went on to um, encourage them and, and mentor them for many years. And she had many of these became close friends of Olive's. They, they would come and um, <laughs> 
there were stories about cowboys and Indians spending the night at Olives when they got <laughs> stuck in town too late and couldn't make it home, that she always had a, a banco that you could sleep on or uh, a place to, to curl up in a, a, in a Navajo blanket and, and uh, spend the night. But she remained very close to many uh, Native people of the, uh, of the surrounding communities. Now, this is just to, to give you a little look at, at the other side of Olive, which was this increasingly, increasing interest in uh, abstraction. Uh, this is a, a mural she did in the home Los Poblanos, it's called, of um, Ruth Hannah McCormick and Albert Sims. These were a very notable couple in uh, just outside of Albuquerque. Um, they, he was a senator, I believe. Uh, Ruth Hannah McCormick was a, a, um, a promoter of the arts, and they they bought this property and proceeded to develop it again with uh, John Gamim as their architect. And they commissioned Olive to paint a number of murals. Now, some of them were, again, of animals, uh, uh, mountain sheep, uh, and other kind of more natural uh, lang uh, landscapes and settings. But this one, um, which she calls politics, uh, <laughs> was very much uh, in the spirit of uh, some of her, her uh, inspirations, Kandinsky for one, she was very fond of Kandin Kandinsky's work. She was aware of um, other cubists and uh, later abstract artists. Um, she even said at one point that uh, when friends questioned her, her moving away from the figurative and the, the literal uh, style of painting uh, and, and uh, accused, almost accused her of being a surrealist, she says, I was a surrealist before they had a term for it. <laughs> so she... Uh, was a strong-willed and a strong-spoken, but um, uh, a, t a tender person at the same time. So this is, again, a little review of what she was doing in other media. She had been doing some of these uh, large mural paintings uh, for private people and for a couple of these uh, public institutions. But meanwhile, through the tw 20s and 30s and into the 40s, she was um, doing a great variety of, of painting styles and subjects. Uh, there are watercolors here. There's a portrait of uh, Juan Pino, who was a printmaker uh, from San Juan Pueblo. There's Mary um, Austin is the portrait on the far left, lower far left. Um, uh, she was a, a noted um, individual and, and um, intellectual in Santa Fe at the time, uh, artists and writers and poets and archaeologists also uh, formed a very uh, rich community of friends and in creative individuals um, in Santa Fe in the 1920s and into the 30s. And all of arriving at 1920 was really at the forefront of some of that. That's a, a watercolor up on the left. Um, her, her again, uh, what, she became increasingly fond of watercolor and adept at it. Uh, became looser and looser with age, and um, some more abstract. The uh, oil painting in the lower center uh, is called uh, "Empty Pots," and uh, it is after World War II and a, a reference to refugees. And Olive was very involved, both in the, after the First World War and the Second World War, with a refugee relief. And she contributed uh, some of her artwork to be sold. She gathered um, clothing to be sent. She was um, a, a very active in um, international and peacekeeping efforts. Um, and above that is really a classic painting of hers of the Shalako, which is a, a Zuni Pueblo ceremony. And um, it's, 
it's just to me very interesting to see this this range she um one of one of her quotes actually speaks to this Throughout her life, uh, Olive followed her own counsel, that one cannot go on copying past successes. To do so is stagnation. So she always was posing a new challenge to herself, um, trying a new media, inspired by a, 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 another uh, style of, of uh, artist. She was very, very impressed by El Greco, Chinese brush painters. And so you can see uh, that it's, it's quite a, quite a, a, a range of influences. Now I'm going to just to give, whoops. Okay, here, here are a few more examples of, uh, of Olive's work a bit later. And you can see how she's increasingly abstract um, and uh, loose. And anyway, um, you can see the, the uh, antelope up in the far right. Uh, these, these, again, are that uh, a characteristic image that she, she used very often in the 30s and 40s. And I, I feel somehow the, um, they're silent and they're gentle and they are uh, ephemeral in some way. And many of her, her later works uh, were characterized by kind of an ephemeral setting such as the landscape and sea and cityscape on the uh, left lower painting. Um, this is into the 50s. Uh, late 40s is the um, painting of white sands that's in the center lower location. And on the right is a painting Olive did um, in 1960s. It was a commission by, from the Museum of uh, art in, in, uh, of New Mexico and is one of the last paintings she did, but uh, again, has this very ethereal quality. Um, those early trees that I, I pointed out in some of the early frescoes, you can see uh, remnants of that in the uh, painting at the center top, um, uh, which was again from the 30s. Um, it is uh, the Navajo chant, B chant, and uh, incorporated imagery and some qualities of some of the indigenous artists of that period. Here she is actually um, with that first commission at the Santa Fe Public Library. Um, she was sketching her preliminary uh, images on the wall. It was a difficult location for a mural because it's on the staircase and she had to adjust the figures so they could be seen and that the perspective was correct. But here she is, um, 1934, um, in her early 60s, um, on a scaffolding and um, hard at work on a very large uh, mural. This is going to be done in fresco, so it's going to be wet plaster. And she also um, wound up decorating the entrance to the building um, the, uh, with a fresco around the doorway. And uh, those images, they're kind of flower-like images, uh, were based on the stone reliefs in Mexico that she had drawn on one of her trips. And we found these drawings in, in her archive. So the, the theme of this, this mural was really the book and uh, how the library reaches the people. And it was um, the Women's Club of Santa Fe that was sponsoring this along with the federal government. Um, and they were hoping to really give um, a, a, um, a boost to the, the, the idea of literacy and of it spreading throughout the, the countryside. Um, and not only in a library in a, in a city, but the books being taken. Uh, and you can see the, the fellow with the um, uh, uh, donkeys carrying boxes on their back out to uh, communities. Um, the uh, two women in the lower portion on a farm receiving books by mail. 
Here's some of the more recent photographs of these images. Again, um, a, quite an undertaking uh, for anyone at any age, but this was truly a, a, a a major work for for her and again a major uh public statements um she she created many of the images herself and designed them and was um very conscious of of literacy and the importance of um it to the communities around santa fe as well as to the city itself this is really one of the uh, central figures um, that she painted in the library. And this is a mother reading to her children. Um, a massive figure. It reminds me sometimes of uh, Michelangelo's ceiling figures. Um, Olive was a bold painter and uh, she had a sense of, of grandeur, I think. And we'll see a few more images that are, they're not just decorative, they are um, uh, monumental in some, in some ways. And this uh, phrase was painted into the murals, con buenos libros, no estas solo. With good books, one is never alone. Now this is her second commission uh, from the New Deal project, uh, and it is in Las Cruces at the, um, what was known then as A and M College, but it is now the University, New Mexico State University, at Los Cruces, and the the bio, biology building. Uh, I don't know if it had been newly erected, but it was in need of uh, some uh, furnishings and decoration, and it was um, uh, made a, a project for her in 1936. And the central area you see here is uh, like uh, under the dome. And it was, um, this was Olive's initiative. She made it look as though you are looking through a microscope and there are all these small creatures and protozoa and um, uh, li uh, images of life on a very small scale painted on the ceiling of uh, this biology building. The other murals you can see in the background here, there's uh, animal husbandry, there's a, a rider on horseback, and um, a, a few uh, images of Olive, again, uh, age 63, up on scaffolding and ladders, painting into wet plaster, having designed quite a complex um, uh, booklet. <laughs> It's really a story telling on the walls. And we'll see um, a couple of those examples up closer. On the left is um, a view of a couple who were chili farmers in the Mesilla Valley. And there had been a, a, a problem with the chili, a, a blight that was damaging plants and, and really affecting the economy of Southern New Mexico. And as the biology building and the agricultural uh, department, um, they were dealing with questions like this and problems. And so she addresses it straight on with um, uh, a solution to the chili blight that the uh, university had come up with. And on the right, this was um, an another initiative of the agricultural department and uh, experimenting with cotton to develop a more resistant strain and um, th they succeeded and here's a, a, a young boy uh, filling a bag with with cotton that was again a product of southern New Mexico. Now this is um, those two first two uh, New, New Deal uh, murals were both in, Me in New Mexico. This one, based on the success of the other two, she, uh, Olive was asked to do um, a uh, paint a new post office uh, mural in um, Pahuska, Oklahoma. Now, Pahuska is, a, is in, right in the center of Osage country. The Osage tribe owns the land, was very prosperous at this time. They had uh, 
oil resources. They had made treaties with the state and with others about um, the production of oil. It was, they were um, major players uh, at that time. And, and, and this was um, a, not, not as large mural as some of the others she had done, but something to document the tribal traditions and the opening up and the agreements and um, um, connections that had been made between the tribe and the surrounding community. She, uh, she had a photograph in her archive of a, uh, a man with a mohawk hair, haircut from about this period. And I'm sure she used it to help her <laughs> know how you were going to show a mohawk. Now, this is the uh, second uh, mural done outside of New Mexico. This is a, was a commission from the post office in Florence, Colorado. Um, antelopes grazing. Um, it was a, I think the theme was a, uh, selected by the community itself. And it, uh, this, like the previous uh, mural, it was done in oil paint on canvas. And in this case, she actually painted it in her studio in Santa Fe. And the, and the panels uh, with the paint were moved to uh, Florence, Colorado and installed on the wall. You can see the seams, and I suspect that's more recently visible than in the beginning. But it was a perfect uh, kind of image for her to to be asked to do because of this whole tradition she had of deer and antelope, yeah. and of northern uh, northern New Mexico is a, a symbol symbolic uh, creature of the plains uh, and of southern uh, Colorado. Um, and there is very recently in the last two years, a stamp, a, a, a US postage stamp was made of this image along with four other uh, murals from the uh, New Deal WPA period. So you can obtain uh, your own version of this mural on a stamp and they are selling them together as a collection, I believe. Okay, we're in the home stretch. Though her work for the um, for the federal government and for the New Deal stopped at this point in the late 30s, she had one more commission in her. And it was a commercial opportunity with um, a, a business on C Central Avenue in Albuquerque. It is a jewelry store and Indian trading post, quite well known in that era of the th 30s, uh, Maisel's Indian trading post. The building had e either been designed, I believe it was designed new uh, by again, the architect John Gamim, who had worked with Olive on a number of, of these uh, commissions. And he had asked Olive, again to provide murals for the entrance way above um, above the uh, windows and uh, and they go around a corner and draw you into the shop and olive once again deferred to her indian colleagues and she hired uh, um, i must have been almost 10 different individual painters to carry out most of the murals. And she didn't choose uh, just anyone. She had some of the best in native painters uh, available doing these murals. Uh, Aguatsira or Alfonso Roybal is a very well-known artist. He, he, is, uh, he did the painting up on top. Um, and again, the uh, artists are, are recording their own traditions, their own uh, myths sometimes, their own uh, beliefs. And uh, as below the Navajo uh, ceremonial hunt is depicted by Narciso uh, Abeta, and he currently has work, is no longer living, but he, there's a major show of his work and his 
son's work at the Wheelwright Museum at this time. But here, these are quite large paintings. They were not done in fresco. They were done in casing, in this case, on plaster. So, and Olive could not resist, but she contributed three of her own works on uh, the entrance to the shop. This is a, a, a wonderful painting of um, deer dancers that she had drawn back in the um, late 20s when she was near San Juan Pueblo, actually had been at the dance and had recorded uh, the, the posture and, and the feeling. And there are her trees again that are quite abstract and uh, simplified, but very iconic. This is known as the gathering of corn. This is also by Olive, a family out in the fields gathering corn, which was so important, not only to, uh, to uh, nutrition and, and living, but to spiritual ceremonies. The uh, pollen, corn pollen was critical for many of um, indigenous ceremonies. And this really, a, again, monumental, like that woman leading, mother lead, reading to her children. This is, um, uh, has a quality, I think, of some of the Chinese um, monumental and very simplified paintings of horses. Um, it's just, I think, again, a very powerful painting done in, uh, you know, her her later years, um, done on scaffolding, and um, and still all of these are still visible um, on the walls of this shop. However, the shop has recently been sold, and there's a lot of concern about how these paintings will be preserved in the future. They are unique and they are extremely important. And um, it's again, one of those projects that um, I would like to see uh, people become more aware of the importance of preservation. Here we have Olive who's saying goodbye to us. Um, this is at her home, her, her garden door. And uh, I, I, I wanted to share with you one other reason why I um, really was pleased to have this opportunity to share what I know about Olive and to reach a broader audience because because I think that she has not been um, appreciated in the last few decades. She was a major figure, a unique woman, um, remarkable in many of her, the causes that she supported in the artistry that she developed over uh, a 70 year career as a painter. Um, and there's concern today that her home and studio be preserved. Um, there, there's, it's still a very historic and intact building and um, there's hope of it and the, the contents, because much of her furniture is still there, uh, her archives, many of her later paintings are there. And it is truly a, um, a important monument and legacy for Santa Fe. So I'm hoping that the community will appreciate this and help with its preservation. Okay. I just wanted to, to be present <laughs> for the last of this. Um, I, I have a couple of pages here, and I think they may be posted on the uh, uh, National New Deal website. But I, I wanted to give credit to the people who have gone before me and, and done a lot of the research and um, are major resources for, for all of you to, to uh, approach. Again, these are other, uh, I didn't, give credit for all the photography. Some of it is my own, but much of it came from these resources. Um, and uh, you should know that uh, the Archives of American Art and uh, that the Smithsonian has a large portion of Olive's uh, archives and, and it is all available online. One can see letters, uh, photographs of artworks, really extensive. Uh, resource. And then these others are um, also 
Each of them have some photographs, have some very valuable information. Leave you with a quote from Olive. Um, she, she had many things to say, and uh, her artist statements are often very interesting to, to read, and they're, they're often the spiritual element to them. But she's, uh, one of her famous quotes is, you must learn to, <clears throat> You must learn your own best way of living and creating. You are an individual in art and in life. Thank you all for listening, and uh, thanks to the New Deal. Thank you. I can't thank you enough, Bettina, for such a wonderful presentation. And you really have taken her quote to heart with your own life. And therefore we in New Mexico have benefited. Thank you. I also want to point out that two of the murals that you showed up that were New Deal presentations, um, we have spent thousands of dollars preserving them. And that is the one at New Mexico State University in the biology building, uh, which was quite a challenge for uh, the conservator that got to take that one on. And then the one that you mentioned that you said in the Santa Fe Library, uh, that is one of my favorites, but it's not now. That building is not the Santa Fe Library that we know today. It's across the street. It was the first library, and then they moved the library across the street to the New Deal building that was the uh, fire station, et cetera, et cetera. So go to what is the history building with the big history museum, which has a big uh, bronze statue of uh, one of our dear fine friends from Santa Fe. Uh, so we're very, very blessed to have had her speak with us for today. And I, we learned a lot. Um, and uh, I hope that you'll be with us you can join us anytime. Uh, we're the National New Deal Preservation Association with the New Mexico chapters here in Santa Fe. And we mentioned the uh, website, which this will be on, is nndpanewmexico.org. And we hope to hear from you, and we will let you know of our next programs. The next one that is coming up is going to be our state historian speaking about Spanish American music. And wow, do we have something to show you about that that was done in the New Deal here in New Mexico. Thank you all for being with us today She's going to close and that, particularly to Bettina and our staff person who just keeps saving us with his technology uh, beyond anything that I'll ever have. Thank you, Brad, uh, Money Keep, for helping us today make this happen. Goodbye.